In this video, we will review atomic structure. So our modern understanding of atomic structure really began at the turn of the century around 1800. Um, at this time, there were a number of um, laws that developed out of research, sorry, uh, that built up to Dalton's law of atomic theory. We had the law of conservation of mass, which states that in a chemical reaction, matter is not destroyed or created. We had the law of multiple, or sorry, the law of definite proportions. After that, it said that all samples of a given compound, no matter where you get them from or how they're prepared, will have the same proportions. So that means things like water is always two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, or H2O. No matter where you get that water, that's what defines water. The law of multiple proportions states that um, any two elements that will form different compounds will do so in a way um, that can be expressed in a ratio of small whole numbers. And so this is basically saying we'll never have a case where we have H, hydrogen bonded to half of an oxygen atom. We'll always have atoms in whole numbers, so we can't split an atom in half. Ah. And all of this builds up to Dalton's atomic theory around 1810. And Dalton's atomic theory states that each element is um, composed of tiny indestructible indestructible particles called atoms, that atoms are just this foundational building block to what an element is. And that all atoms of a given element will have the same mass and the same properties. So these things will distinguish them from other elements. Atoms will be able to combine in, in whole number ratios to form compounds. Again, this is stating that you can't split an atom in half and that atoms of one element cannot change into atoms of another element. Now, in a chemical reaction, atoms will be able to change the way they're bonded to each other um, and create a new compound, but that you won't actually change the atom itself. Now, the one exception to this that we'll talk about soon is nuclear chemistry, where we see um, unstable nuclei or unstable atoms decay into other types of atoms. Our modern picture of how the atom is structured came out of a series of experiments um, that I won't go into too much detail, but we'll mention them. J.J. Thompson's cathode ray experiment led to the discovery of the electron. The oil drop experiment led to the discovery that that electron was charged with a negative charge. Uh, Rutherford's gold foil experiment is famous where, and that's right, they discovered the nucleus um, and brought us away from this picture of an atom that was like a chocolate chip cookie where everything was kind of randomly dispersed within a space, uh, within the space of the atom. And then uh, the work of Chadwick was able to actually explain that the mass of the nucleus um, is dependent on, an, on something that isn't charged, a neutron. And so we get this picture of the atom from these experiments that um, has a volume that is dependent on the electrons. But the electrons are very tiny and they do not weigh very much compared to the nucleus. And so the mass of the atom is consolidated in the center of it, in the nucleus, and it takes up a very small amount of volume. So our electrons define the volume, but the mass is defined by the, defined by the nucleus. So atoms um, will contain subatomic particles. Inside the nucleus, we'll have protons that have a positive charge and neutrons that have no charge at all. And then around the nucleus, we'll have electrons that carry a negative charge. And a great deal of chemistry is founded on the simple principle that like charges repel and unlike charges are attracted to each other. 
similar to magnets or to the dating advice that opposites attract. Uh, so our positive charges, like so two protons coming close together will repel one another. Two electrons that are negatively charged that come close to each other will also repel. But if we brought a electron and a proton together, so they're opposite charges, they'll be attracted to one another. To get a sense of size, um, we have the masses of our subatomic particles here and their actual charge in coulombs. We'll just refer to the charges of these particles as our protons are plus one, neutrons are zero, and our electrons are negative one. Um, our mass in kilograms is super tiny. We have another unit of mass called atomic mass units that are, that are not part of the metric system. Um, so there isn't a straightforward conversion between kilograms and atomic mass units, though there is a conversion factor. Um, and really, atomic mass units are getting to this idea that we can approximate the atomic mass of a proton is one, the atomic mass of a neutron is one, and the atomic mass of an electron is zero. We were rounding to one significant figure. And so looking at the difference in mass between these, especially electron to proton, we can see that electrons do have mass. It's just a rounding error when we look at the mass of a neutron and proton. When we look at the size of the atom, um, the overall volume is on the order of 10 to the negative 10 meters. So that's 0 0.2345. That many meters. It's a small number. But if you look at this, the actual nucleus is even smaller. It's on the order of 10 to the negative 15. Um, so that's an extra five zeros. Um, and this demonstrates the, the great, great difference in, in the size that the electrons take up in the electron cloud that defines the volume of your atom. Kind of like our mass is very different between our proton or neutron and electron. So in general, our, pro, our proton number defines our element. So an element is just um, like an element with one proton will always be hydrogen. And an element with two protons will always be helium. But within an element, um, atoms can have different numbers of neutrons. And these are our subatomic particles that have no charge, but they do have mass. And so we call these elements that have different masses isotopes of one another. So isotopes are just atoms of the same element that have a different number of neutrons. And we track the number of neutrons with mass number. This is not on the periodic table. It's equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So all of the subatomic particles that have a significant mass. So we can write an isotope element symbol like this, where we have our mass number written in the top left-hand corner, the atomic number in the bottom right-hand corner, and our element symbol next to that. So reading this element symbol, my atomic number tells me that the actual element, the number of protons, and so my atomic number will be my number of protons. If this is a neutral element or isotope, that'll equal the number of electrons. I'll have the same number of positively charged species as negatively charged species in the element. And then the mass number right here of 35, that's going to be equal to the protons and the neutrons together. So if I want to calculate the number of neutrons, I subtract the number of protons from my mass number to get my number of neutrons, which in this case would be 18. Working a little bit out of order on the lecture notes, um, here's a little bit more about defining elements by their number of protons. Now, the number of elements will always be defined by, or the 
number of protons is the atomic number, which defines the element. And this will always be found on the periodic table. It'll be the only whole number that is on your periodic table information about the element. So our atomic number for lithium is three. This other number that usually has a decimal place is our atomic mass. So it's the, the average mass that an atom might be. Now, if again, as we said, this atomic number, if we are not looking at an ion, if we're looking at something that just has a, a charge of zero, the number of protons and the number of electrons need to be equal. So that way, the positive and negative charges cancel out. Sometimes, though, we have an imbalance in the number of protons and electrons. Now, for an element to have um, different ions, it'll be defined by the number of electrons that it has. If the number of protons changed relative to the number of electrons, then we would be changing the element itself. But when the electron number changes, then we change the ion. So if we had um, in lithium three protons and only two electrons, we would have a positive three charge and we would have a negative two charge from the electrons, which would leave us with an overall charge of plus one. So this would be an ion with a plus one charge. And we would track that in the upper right hand corner of the element symbol. And so um, elements can either gain or lose um, electrons, and they'll give us two different types of ions. So if we gain, um, or sorry, if we lose electrons, we have less electrons than protons, we'll have a positively charged ion that we call a cation. And if we had more electrons than protons, we would have a negatively charged ion, which we would call an anion. Now we, we pointed out that the um, element symbols on the periodic table usually have a number that has a lot of decimal places and we called this atomic mass. This doesn't have anything to do with a specific number of particles in the atom, but instead it represents um, kind of an average of the mass of that particle. So it's really a weighted average um, of the natural abundances of isotopes for an element. This might be easiest to walk through an example. Let's look at chlorine again. So we talked about chlorine 35 that had 18 um, neutrons and it had 17 protons. There's another common isotope, chlorine 37, that has 19 neutrons and 17 protons. And they both have 17 protons, that defines it as chlorine. But these two different isotopes have different numbers of neutrons. I'm sorry, not 19, 20. 20 neutrons. And so they, these two isotopes would have different masses. One would have uh, a mass of two atomic mass units more. Um, and these do not occur um, in the same amount out in nature. Chlorine 35 is far more common than chlorine 37. So if we take the percentage of naturally occurring chlorine, that's chlorine 35 versus chlorine 37, and the mass of these and create a weighted average, then we can calculate the atomic mass of a sample of chlorine atoms, or the likelihood that it would be a specific mass especially if we had a lot of atoms with us. So here is our way of defining this. What it really is just saying, because I think this, is, this looks a lot scarier than it is, is that I would take the percent of chlorine 35 and add it to the percent of chlorine, sorry, of chlorine 37. Remember in math, of is the same as times. And so if I had a, if I knew my percentages, I would just multiply my percentage by the mass of each isotope. Let's do that. 
So I can look up this information typically in a periodic table that has information about each isotope within an element um, or a table. For chlorine 35, I can look up its mass and atomic mass units, and I can look up its isotopic abundance that's naturally occurring. It occurs about 75.78% of the time. And so I would convert this into a decimal. I would then take that mass and multiply it by the decimal of my abundance. And so for chlorine 35, that would be, I would get 26.5. And for chlorine 37, if I did the same thing using its mass and its isotopic abundance, I'd get something like 8.9. Then I'm just adding these two together to get 35.45 for four atomic mass units. And this is what we consider to be the atomic mass of chlorine. That. Um, here's another example of gallium. I recommend that you pause the video here and try this on your own, um, and then I will review the solution. Try to calculate the atomic mass of gallium from the information about its atomic mass and its um, naturally occurring abundance.